school and his political awakening. Now on for a conversation which charts the development of one of the foremost black political thinkers and activists of this century, a development which grew alongside his love of cricket. C.L.R. James is talking to Stuart Hall. C.L.R. James is one of the most outstanding black intellectuals of his time. This year, to mark his 85th birthday, an exhibition has been mounted of his life and work and a new production of his play, Black Jacobins, the first since Paul Robeson took the role of Toussaint Louverture in 1936. James has spent much of his life in England and the United States as novelist, historian, cricket writer, above all, political theorist and activist. He was born in Trinidad in 1901 and lived there for the first 30 years of his life. My mother's father was an engine driver. He drove from San Fernando to Pensistong and back. He was notable because he was a fireman and there were no black engine drivers. But his engine driver died suddenly, and they didn't know what to do. So they gave him the job as fireman, and he became the first black fireman. And he was put to fill in the gap, and he kept it. And my mother, my father's father, came from Antigua, one of those islands, where Black men used to see after the, the sugar, but in Trinidad, black men were not allowed to do that. In Trinidad, that job was done by white people, but he came from Antigua, and he could do it. So when there was a problem in the shop, he said, I can do it, and they put him to do it, and he took it. So on both sides, I came from the black not so high lower middle class. <laughs> we were we were something. And my mother is to this day the most persistent reader I know. You say that about both your parents several times. My father was a teacher and he was trained at the Tranquility Training School and he was number one. So between them I grew up, the, I came to England and people asked me, but James, how do you speak English so well? I said, I've never spoken anything else. But it's not just that you spoke English. By then, you had read. Not the... only that, and what I'm trying to say is, in the house, my mother read everything. Without discrimination, everything. And I'm in the house, as she read, I, she would tell me, don't read that but she would put it in some part of her press. I would find it and read it. But what kinds of things were you reading? I tell you, there was Thackeray, there was Dickens, there was Charlotte Bronte, there was Charles Garvis, there was a woman called Mrs. E. D. E. N. Southworth, a whole lot of people, all the people in those days. Because my mother was such a reader, anybody who had a book to read or a book to be read, came to my mother. And I'm astonished, when I was about seven or eight, in the house, she had her own Shakespeare, she had her own Vanity Fair, and her own Last of the Mohicans. And nowadays, I look back at what the world was like in 1907. I say that because I was not yet eight when I began to take exams. And I find it astonishing that my mother so happened, had been so educated. That's a, that's that a she, very remarkable that, time. 
I don't think there were many people in those days who accept the middle classes in England who had the opportunities that I had. And it wasn't only one book. She kept on reading so that I had books all the time. But one book in the house that was there for a long time, Vanity Fair, I read that over and over. I wonder if you know how many times you read Vanity Fair. I don't know, but I read it <laughs> twice a year. I read it all the time until I was about 30-something. The book means a lot to me. It shaped my early life. So it's not why Vanity Fair, but what Vanity Fair. I kept on reading it. And I was so young when I was reading it that when I came to Major Dobbin, I would have to turn back to see where he came in. And I marked the page. So when I get into trouble with Dobbin, I know exactly where to go and read him. Now that's my life. That's the way I begin. But I was a bright boy. And I must say, I didn't know that. It's only afterwards that I began to look at the advantages and the disadvantages of having been number one, a bright boy, and number two, the schoolmaster's son. Did that separate you from other people? Separated me very much. Separated me from them and separated them from me. Because I could read and read a lot of books so that obviously they, and when anything came up, I had read it, I knew. My God, from the time I was about six years old, I have been the one to know. It's only within the last 10 years that I've become an ignoramus, not knowing. At the age of 11, he entered the world of Queen's Royal College, or QRC, a kind of English public school transplanted to Port of Spain. I went to QRC and made two adventures into knowledge. I began to play cricket and to read about it and to learn about it, and I began to read books, all books. There were books in the library, but the master's room had a set of books, which every master who had come there he would bring a book and put it in, and so on. And I used to lunch at school. My parents in the country, I would come bring my lunch to eat, and the master's library over the booth right there. And there were books on the master's tables in every room. All English literature and a good bit of French literature, Latin and Greek were at my disposal. So from the time I was about 11, Latin, Greek, French, some European literature, between 11 and 18, that was there. I had nothing to do but to take it. And what I didn't like, I put back. Those were exceptional circumstances I want to get. Not every boy got a no. uh, range of literature like that. I happened to take my lunch at the school, and at a quarter past 11, everybody went home, and I had nothing to do but to eat my sandwich, and there were the books. And I had a wonderful, I look back now, that was an exceptional opportunity, which I used. But how did the interest in, in cricket begin? I don't mean playing, because lots of people play, no, but the my interest father in studying gave me, cricket. No, my father gave me a bat and a ball when I was about four years old. Because he had been a cricketer in those days to be a cricketer in the, in the Caribbean was something. You were a civilized person. What I look back at is there were eight masters there. Seven of them were men who had degrees from Oxford and Cambridge. So they gave their stamp to the school. And we grew up that way. In addition, there were books in the library, one by a writer, boys writer, called P.G. Wardhouse. Wrote a lot of books about English public school. And I read those books. And those books and the masters, the way they behaved, the way they conducted themselves, the way they spoke, and the games that we played, because I had been playing a lot of cricket with a piece of a bat or some ball or some orange, but it was organized. And there was first 11, second 11, third 11, fourth 11. There we were, organized. So I got into 
an organized society different from the one I came from, but it was organized not so much in learning. I paid little attention to what they taught me in school, but I plunged head foremost into the organization of society outside. First of all, the games that we had once a year, we, and I became a tremendous high jumper for years. I was the highest jumper in the Caribbean. When at one time I was jumping 5'11", and the world record was 6'3", which told me because we jumped sideways in those yeah. days. As interest in that, cricket, football I played, but cricket I learned to become an authority. So I've been writing on cricket since I was about 18. So playing and writing, and not only that, I was the authority, I was the expert. Due to my curiosity, because everything I could find I read, and my marvelous memory. The culmination of his cricket writing came in 1963 with the publication of Beyond a Boundary, one of the most unusual books about sport ever written. Treating cricket as artistic and dramatic spectacle, as well as putting it in the context of England, the empire, and the anti-colonial struggle. But in fact, his first literary efforts took the form of fiction. I'd written a short story. I used to write stories. We used to publish. And in 1928, a volume appeared, the best short stories of 1928. Every year, the volume used to appear with the best short stories of England, and there in the middle of it was my short story. Thereupon, a lot of information was converted to the Caribbean people. One, that James was a writer, and number two, to James, that he could write. <laughs> the best short story, I wrote it. Such thing had never crossed my mind, but from that time, more or less, I was going to be a writer. I believe I'd had it in mind early. That is, I was about seven years old. We were still living in Northridge, but that I can go by. And I wrote a story, and I showed it to my mother, about 10 pages in a copy book. And she said, that is the last of the Americans that we've been reading. You only take it from there, and you put it in Trinidad. So I said, OK. <laughs> For his next book, James turned to politics. He wrote a short biography of the white Trinidadian labor leader, Captain Cipriani, one of the first to pose the question of Caribbean independence. This was later published as The Case for West Indian Self-Government in London in 1932. Is your decision to write the biography of Cipriani really your first political involvement? Involvement, I think you are correct. But in all previous people who were talking about independence or putting up for elections against the establishment, I was in favor. All the young people who were literary or well-read were in favor generally. But involved, the actual writing about Cipriani was quite a step, because nobody had done anything like that before. And when it was heard that I was doing it, a lot of people told me, or wanted to know, I went around speaking and showed it to Sibri, and he said, by all means. It was a step not only for me, but for everybody, that Sibri's biography should be written. Now, I want to ask you something about your formation at this stage, because on the one hand, you've spoken a great deal about the importance of, of Queen's Royal College. Uh, a school in, in Trinidad very much modeled on a kind of English public school and of the influence of teachers with an Oxford and Cambridge background and the strong influence of English literature, etc. That's one model and a powerful formation for you. On the other hand is this growing involvement in, in the Caribbean and West Indian independence, etc. How do you reconcile these two forces at that stage of your life? I didn't have to reconcile because I got interested in the struggle for colonial independence. It wasn't so much Africa as India. Nehru and Gandhi became very important. 
And we talked about them and felt that the Caribbean Trinidad was a part of it too. And the Labour Party in Britain, which used to talk about independence and so forth, was so in general, we had our feet pointed the correct way. We didn't do so much, but there we were. And then about 1929, 1930, the movement swelled and I began to take part because before that we were going to meetings, voting and not doing much. Your novel, Minty Alley, is not published until later, but it's written in this period. It was written about 1928. And it's very much about the life of ordinary Trinidadians. Such as I knew it, my instinct is always to write about what I saw and what I knew. I had learned that from the study of European literature. So I, very well educated by them, knew that the proper way for me to write was to write about what I knew. And I had this great advantage. Nobody else had written. So I, I had a whole field open to myself. And when I began to write about it, the people said, OK, wonderful, so that I was being pushed along by a very helpful breeze. Yes. It's a, at that time, 32, that you take the decision to go to England. I had felt before that, that ultimately I had to go to England because they were only publishing little pamphlets and so to make a living as a writer. I had to go to England. And people told me, you're going to starve. Writers in England don't. But Larry Constantine told me, you come, and you'll see how you get on. And what had happened when I went is quite a story. I mean, what's your first impressions of England in 1932? I was in London for about three months, March till about May. How many black people are in London at that time? Not any? too many, not, not too many, a few. I tell you what struck me, I think I remember it. The familiarity between white women and black men. In London, they're quite at home, which is quite something for me to carry me in, you know. But my eyes were open and I realized that this was not some Trinidad expanded to Europe, but this was what really mattered. I tell you what surprised me somewhat. The East End, the poverty and the broken down houses and the cheap restaurants where you got a cup of tea and a piece of toast or stale cake. When I said, but that ain't too different from, yes. But nevertheless, you know, I am fairly level-headed. I realize the British Academy concerts and all that we didn't have. And the, 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 the picture gallery and the books and all that. Then I went to Paris, tremendous. Paris impressed me more than London because of the books and the concentration of the Paris intellectual life. England was not like that. After arriving in England in 1932, James set off for Nelson, Lancashire. There he lived with his old Trinidadian friend, Larry Constantine, the great cricketer, later to become the first black lord. James still played cricket and more importantly, got a job writing about it for the Manchester Guardian as Neville Cardis's deputy. He became an active member of the Independent Labour Party, the ILP. Most importantly, he made his first encounter with Marxism as a political theory. And the editor of the Nelson newspaper was a man named Cartmel. And they all were very pleased that Larry Constantine, the cricketer, should have a person like C.L.R. James writing for the Manchester Guardian. So I went to his office 
And he said, well, Mr. James, here are these books, and he gave me the history of the Russian Revolution by Leon Trotsky, Volume 1. And another book he gave me was The Decline of the West by Spengler. So I read both those books and immediately began to see the vast amount of history which I knew. So from there, I suddenly became a Marxist. I tell you a peculiar story. After a year or two, I have read all the Marxist books because it's easy now. So I said, well, I was joined the Marxist movement. So I said, where are some trusts? Where are some trustees? Because I know that the communists are terrible liars. I have read the literature of the movement. So where are some trustees? They tell me down Hampstead. So I go down there. So I join, I sit down to join. There are one or two other people who come to join. And these are asking questions. And the tr official Trotskyists can't answer. So I, who have come to join, and one of the joiners, I have to take up the defense of Trotskyism against the critiques of those who want to join. So I join by defending critiques. I become a very important person. In two shakes, I'm chairman of the Trotskyists. What? You were persuaded by Trotsky's account of the Russian Revolution. Um, I was persuaded by that. And by Trotsky's account of what had happened in the Soviet Union? I read, but, but uh, I must say, I read the, the, the Stalinist account. I bought the Stalinist books, I read them. Both of them were referring to Lenin. I bought the, the 12 volumes of Lenin, read them, referring to Marx, and I bought Capital Volume 1, the 18th movement of Louis Bonaparte. I read all of those, and then I say, no. I am a Marxist and I want to join the Trotskyists. But I had read them before I... So when I went in there, they didn't have to teach me anything. I had to teach them. And there was one Trotskyist organization in that period? There, was, there never is one Trotskyist <laughs> organization. But there is one organization and there are one or two around. But it hadn't split up really then. Not only was the Trotskyist organization in Britain, it was international. We used to go to Paris and have conferences there, and I always went to the conference. And to be quite honest, I went because it was good to go to an international conference, but I thought the food was wonderful. So I always went to every conference. I had three or four days eating, because in England, oh, God of mercy. Mm -hmm. But you were also very active in, in Trotsky's politics in England in that period, because uh, I know people who I heard you speak a lot I was the secretary of the, of the British Trotsky's organization. Oh, yes, I was very active. Not only was I very active, I was known as such. And people used to say, not only I was a Trotsky's, I'm just talking about history, that is the real Marxist in England. That, all that had before the war. I had a real reputation in Britain because I didn't only know about Trotsky and Stalin. I had read the classics of Marxism and my memory, I understood them. So people would send for me to Bristol, Glasgow, Aberdeen, Nottingham, North Wales, South Wales, Swansea, all over the goddamn place. Come and talk. And they didn't want to hear so much about Trotskyism. They wanted somebody who would talk about Marxism very much concerned about the theories of Marxism and somebody who would expound it. James became deeply involved with the African independence movement, editing pamphlets and working closely with George Padmore, a fellow Trinidadian. Padmore was not a Trotskyist, but a communist, who had spent a number of years working in Moscow, but who by this time was primarily concerned with colonial freedom and the anti-imperialist struggle. Padmore and I had known one another as boys, 10 years old, in the Caribbean. His father was a teacher, my father was a teacher. They both were friends, and they used to meet and speak, and we and George and I used to play together. But his father's name was Nurse, Alfonso Nurse, and he was Malcolm Nurse. 
Then he left and went away, and I in the Caribbean began to read as the years went by and hear about a revolutionary leader named George Padmore. So I, I come to England. I come to England in 1932, somewhere in 34, 35. I hear that Padmore is coming from America or is going to have a meeting in London. So I go to see the great man. I go and say, Malcolm Nurse. So he said, well, boy, how is it? And after the meeting, we went somewhere and having something to eat till four in the morning talking. So in spite of your political differences, you and Padmore are increasingly able to work together. We were always able to work together. George would be in the Communist Party, I was a Trotskyist, but that didn't matter. We would always meet and talk and eat together. And is that around the, the African question? And no, what? it wasn't. We were friends and became friends. Padmore was, had, was a great admirer of Marxism. And although he had left the, 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 Len, the Moscow people, he made me to understand that for him, Marxism still remained the center of his political ideas. And we formed the Pan-African Congress. When was that? About 1937, I believe, I was the chairman. It was a very vague. We got together, but we chiefly to the idea of Africa. Caribbean didn't matter so much. He was full of the African history, Marxism, and I was full of the European history, which he appreciated as something I used to insist, that Marxism takes off from where the historians, politicians, and economists of the bourgeois society finished. Their Marxism begins, the political economy and so forth, and Padmore very much appreciated that. In addition to that, he was a very social person, a very fine person. He's very good looking, very elegant, and so forth. And a Marxist, undeviating, but ready to talk to anybody. He was one of the old West Indian types. I don't know if you know what I mean. Tell the me that. old Victorian type. He was one, but a Marxist. And he didn't lose that. The old Victorian. You know, it was easy enough to imagine him in a frock coat and a topper. But he wasn't, but he was an elegant person, fine manners, speech, style, sympathetic, friendly, but undeviating Marxist. Oh, yes. Now, let me tell you, the persons whom I remember most clearly are George Padmo, Kenyatta, myself one or two Nigerians. But Kenyatta was no more a Marxist than he was a follower of John Milton. Kenyatta joined the movement because it was a struggle against the imperialists. Padmore kept a balance, but his orientation was to make the movement be aware of the colonial struggle. I was the chairman, but Padmore was the one Padmore taught me the importance of Pan-Africa. James's major work of this period was Black Jacobins, a history of the successful slave revolt in 1791 in what was then San Domingo and is now Haiti. Black Jacobins points the connections between black movements in the Caribbean and the revolutionary developments in France. To research the book, James had to spend a great deal of time in Paris was a great center, and I was fairly fluent in French at the time. And then I was a black man. And what was remarkable that they really were surprised that I knew more about French literature, apart from Greek and Roman, than they did, than some of the French people did, because the French people were reading modern French literature, but I had done Molière and Racine, Corneille at school, and I taught it. So here was I, black, and I didn't know too many black people in those days, speaking French and familiar with French literature. I remember walking along with Braun, very intelligent man, Czechoslovakian. Was killed afterwards, but fluent in English literature and everything else. 
and we were walking along the street in Paris, and he was very sophisticated, very made a reference. He says, that question slipped me, and I told him, I think I must have told him, Racine or Corneille. So he stopped, but he, he, I remember, he says, Jim, where do you come from? <laughs> and I had to explain to him, I say, your problem is, in regard to me, you have in mind Africa, African tribes, African language. A West Indian is not that. English is my native language, and I was, 10 years of age, I was doing Greek and Latin. So I grew up, and then after a year or two, French literature and French language. So that, so that's me. So that I would know this is not surprising. What would be surprising is if I didn't know it. So. Are you the, uh, had people worked on the primary documents of the Saint Domingue Revolution in Paris before you went into there those were archives? Some writers. There were no people in English, but there were French writers who had done. But uh, none of them were Marxists, you see. And I had an angle, a method of handling the same material that they had handled with different results. That book created quite a sensation. It still remains the standard text, you know, after nearly 50 years. And they, in France in particular, they were glad to see it because there were no such books. Okay, with all due respect, can we come to an end? I'm very tired. How I take care of my looks is up to me. And for my hair, only recital will do. You've written eloquently in this period about your friendship and relationship with Paul Robeson. I knew Paul, and like everybody who knew him, had an immense liking and respect for this magnificent person. He is the most astonishing person I have ever met. Not only he could sing, he was a good actor. He wasn't super, but his presence, and in addition to all these gifts which impressed the public, he was a marvelous man in private conversation. Paul would speak and speak at length, but he had the faculty that very few have, very few great speakers. He could listen, and he could talk a length of time and then listen to you and keep on listening. So you were never bothered by him. He's an extraordinary human being. He's a man I remember very well, very clearly, and with a great deal of respect and satisfaction. Did you agree with him politically? No. I wouldn't say that, but I kept away from that. I believe that the Stalinists made more of Paul's association with them than he did. He never said he belonged to anything, but he went along and would refer to them, and they would pick it up as Paul Robeson said. Robeson, Stalinism, the Communist Party, Paul Robeson, they kept that going. But Paul was, if anything, sympathetic to them. But I believe the man I knew was somewhat cautious because he was a public figure. And to commit himself to those people would have been a technical mistake, a social mistake. In addition, personally, well, they, they're ready. They were Paul Rosen all the time. If you yes. listen to them, you would believe. But he, even talking to me, he would say, well, you know, see a Leave it there. Of course, Robeson played Toussaint Louverture. Yes. That was he a... played Toussaint Louverture. That was before I went to the United States. That was in Britain here. And I wrote the play before I published The Black Jacobins. I don't know what was in my head. And then somebody saw it and told me. So I used to, t everybody used to talk to Paul and be glad to be in his company. In the 30s, it was very difficult, you know. Black people were isolated, there were so few of us. 
So I used to meet him periodically. We'd have some tea somewhere or something, some people talk. So I met him and I told him, by the way, I have a play, you know. And people think that you will do very well. I think so too. He said, well, let me see it. And in those days, there weren't many plays in which a leading part would be played by a black man. So he read it and told me, yes, I would. And from there, it went. That was written before uh, Black Jack was published. But the whole before. conception of Black Jack The conception was, was there, there but. Uh, I had written essays here and there, and I delivered lectures. I mean, people now talk about Black Jacobins as an important historical book, but really, it was also a thesis about contemporary black politics, wasn't it? It was, and politics that is fundamental is always applicable to different periods of history, because fundamental politics always has behind it the struggle of different classes, Different sections of the class can struggle and kill one another, but that is not much a social event as when one social structure is fighting against another part of the social structure. Certain logical and historical things emerge which are applicable to similar periods a thousand years before or after. But what is the significance of Toussaint Louverture for you? I mean, how do you see the connection between those events in, in Haiti then and the 20th century politics? I have already said during the last few minutes that any great revolutionary event in history, from it you can always find principles and historical movement ideas that are complied to others. I was saying that before. Now, that is so in any great revolution, and the San Domingo Revolution was the first great revolution of black people. Now, when you consider the role that Africa was going to play in the world in the years to come, that then acquires a significance. Furthermore, it was a part of the French Revolution so that you have in that historical event a duality in which it takes part in the great revolutions is very important. The first was the British. And at the same time, it points the finger to the revolutions among colonial peoples. So that that revolution is something that is worthy of consideration by every type of historian. If even you're studying the French Revolution, that is the extreme point of the French Revolution in Europe. But at the same time, it's the beginning of the colonial upheavals. So that is, a, from the point of view of the historian, a significant, in fact, a dominating feature of the study of history. That's a wonderful connection. But for you, it's not, it's not just by chance that that happens in the Caribbean, is it? The important thing, as far as I'm concerned, is the date of my first book, The Black Jacobins. It is 1938. That's to say it is before World War II and all that took place after. It, somehow or other, I believe, well, I don't want to go into this, but I believe it is the fact that I'm from the Caribbean. Why do you attribute it to that, though? Not 1938 is a very important year in the Caribbean, after all. Yes, it's but that, coming to consciousness of the Caribbean yes, labor but, movement. Uh, but I don't want to go into that because it will lead me too far. In 1938, C.L.R. James went to the United States for what turned out to be a major phase of his political life, but which at the time he thought would only be a short visit. Had you always wanted to go? I wanted to go, but not particularly. When you My went, orientation you... was towards Britain from literature, history. When you went, did you realize you'd be there so long? No, I didn't. I went intending to come back, but I stayed and I decided, well, it would be good to stay a little longer. And I asked one or two people, particularly Freddie Forrest, Raya Dunayevskaya, and she persisted in telling me, don't go back, stay. She felt that I was introducing something that the movement needed. 
Uh, this is the period when you met Trotsky in... in no, in 38, I met Trotsky. Yes. And I was a member of the Trotskyist movement with many doubts, political doubts. One has them everywhere. All my ideas today are not definitive, but I met him in this, about March 38. And I had just spent a few days in Mexico talking to him, and then something happened. My doubts became certain, because Trotsky had answered nothing of all that was developing inside of me. I wanted to know this and that. And I came to the conclusion then that an international in the form of a certain body of people organized to lead the masses, that was finished. We had arrived at a stage where there was no need to any leading organized body. I'll come to that in a minute, but I want to know what your impression of Trotsky was, nevertheless, that in spite of differences. That is a question always asked me, and it's a question that I cannot answer. What is the impression have I got of Trotsky? Was he a tall man or short man? Well, no, I mean, were well, you impressed what, by him? I was impressed by him. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I couldn't be impressed by him because I had read it all before. So there it was in person what I already had in mind. People ask me that question, particularly the Americans. They are very much impressed with the, impressed with the personality of I, I was impressed with one thing. He moved about in languages with a facility that me, Anglo-Saxon mentality, found very strange. Mm -hmm. He would speak as he, uh, he spoke in English and had prepared because of me. But frequently, he couldn't find an English word, he would use a French word. But in between, German, Russian, whatever, that, uh, that dazzled me. But what he said did not impress me particularly because I knew it all before. I had read his writings. I was educated not on Marx, but on the Trotsky's writings. I went to Marx and Lenin afterwards. James's mature political position, which has influenced countless black generations since then, was crystallized in the course of his final break with Trotskyism. He now began to develop, write, and speak about this position under the pseudonym J.R. Johnson. James returned to the roots of Marxism, developing his own view of Lenin's contribution, which led him to emphasize the self-activity of the working class and the autonomy of the black struggle, as opposed to the often held view of the party as the vanguard and centralizing force of the revolution. The common view here would be to associate Lenin's name and Leninism with a very strong position on democratic centralism. That is the common view. But that is not my reading of Lenin. Lenin was driven to that because the social democracy had broken entirely with what he had expected of it. It's very important to know that Lenin did not expect the social democratic betrayal in 1914. Then he became more concerned than ever with the independent party. You can misread his early writings where he said it merely passing. But it is the betrayal in 1914, which he didn't expect at all, that startled him. And he began to say, they are one party, we have to form another one. Now, that is important to remember, because the emphasis on the party was the direct product of the betrayal in 1914. And his writings before and afterwards, the last writings in 1923, show that he still had in his mind a democratic revolutionary movement. James has always written on a wide variety of subjects, historical and cultural. Always in his writing, he's connecting important historical moments with great literary and artistic figures like Shakespeare and Michelangelo, Picasso and Herman Melville. This view is most forcefully developed in Mariner's Renegades and Castaways, the book about Melville which he submitted as part of his case against being expelled from the United States 
in the days of McCarthyism. For me, the same movement, social forces, instinctive strivings that you see in the big political movements, those take a literary form with the great writer or the artist. But it is something the world is changing. So it's purely. And a highly sensitive writer, he's aware of something and he writes. That's what I think. You can't separate them. But what was it about Melville that attracted you? No, that is very difficult to say. That is a man whom I still believe, apart from Shakespeare, handles the English language with a vividness and yet an instinct for the fundamental that I see in nobody else. Those that, if I had to choose two writers, Shakespeare is one, the second one is Melville. A third might be a very reactionary Englishman, Edmund Burke. Great master of the language. You know his work? Not, not as well as you do. Not as well as me, but you know it? Well, you yes. Know, my well, reference is... My you, reference. Oh, yes. But, I mean, the, the handling of the language is very important, but you are, well, not, a, you are not a formalist literary critic. You I wouldn't go not, to Melville just because he wrote well. No, I don't say that at all. I believe that that mastery of the language is not a gift that you are a good writer, but you, this mastery of the language means that in reality, all reality finds a new expression and a powerfully new language means a powerfully new expression of the reality. After his expulsion from the States, James went back again at once to Trinidad. He edited the paper of the People's National Movement, the party led by Eric Williams, his old pupil, author of Capitalism and Slavery. James had always argued that the Caribbean should not be dependent on the United States. But this was not the view of Eric Williams, by then Prime Minister, who wrote to a local newspaper dissociating himself from James's position. The Americans insisted, I have heard so, that he would, they would give help. They would help the Trinidad government. But the first thing they wanted to be sure of was his relation with James. And that accounted for Williams' reversal of everybody. 26 people called, say, you read the paper? Yes, you read what Dr. Williams said? Please, Dr. Jane, what have I say, I don't know. What did he give as a reason for? No, he gave no reason. He merely indicated that he was not hostile to the domination that the, the uh, British and through the British, the Americans exercised over the Caribbean. While we had been writing all the time that that was the enemy, that was the people we have to deal with. And this article said, no, it's all right. That was the difference. But the break didn't stop you because you went on to, I, to, to, to organize he, against it. He couldn't uh, stop me. I mean, the British had, um, um, imperialism couldn't stop me. Williams couldn't. No. <clears throat> But it was a blow because I had been his sponsor and he had done a lot for me since he was about 14 years old. I remember him as a little boy in the fourth form downstairs at QRC with his glasses and short pants. <laughs> I will ask, end with a more personal question. Mm -hmm. E.P. Thompson, at the back of that volume on your life and times has recently come out, said about you, first of all, he noticed, he commented on your Catholicity of taste, the wide range of interests that you had. Secondly, on the revolutionary thrust of your thinking. But he also said something at the end about that it also has something to do with what he called the proper appreciation of the game of cricket. Yes, Are I the things see. connected? No, not to me. There may be, I could sit down and make all sorts of connections. I don't want to do that because that, I couldn't do that and carry any conviction. But Beyond the Boundary begins to carry conviction. Uh, that, is, and that is a whole book. But to sit down and talk to you for five minutes, that I don't want to do. But you're still deeply involved in what happens on the cricket pitch. And Absolutely. It matters, not just as a game. No, no, I like it. And, People are involved, and when the, uh, a cricket match lasts for five days, today in 1984, and you get thousands of people turning up 
for five days. The modern world don't spend five hours on anything. They will finish up with it and go five days. In other words, that thing has penetrated deep into fundamental realities so that people in 1984 can go and spend five days. But historically, does it matter who wins there? <laughs> I know it doesn't matter who wins to me. I used to want the West Indians to win. And that remained with me for a long time, but now I don't care. When you look back at your life, would you think of yourself as basically an optimist or a pessimist? Or are those not the sort of terms you'd use? Using? I never dream of using them. I deal with the historical facts as they are. What will happen tomorrow, I don't know. But by and large, I believe what Marx has said, socialism or barbarism. So it's socialism with everybody taking part or barbarism, some brutal people who dominate millions of people today. Socialism or barbarism? Oh, yes. Yeah. How black?